Hello, this is Anthony Amp Elmore. Today, I'm giving one of my most exciting Buddhist lectures. This lecture today is called Tina Turner and Buddhism. That's exciting. Tina Turner and Buddhism. Now, what makes this lecture so exciting? It is because Tina Turner is the most noted Buddhist in the world. Everybody knows the story of Tina Turner and how she struggled as a Buddhist and she overcame uh, an abusive marriage and now she is known as the queen of rock and roll. What a beautiful and marvelous story to tell. Now, what makes this lecture interesting and what makes this lecture appropriate is because we can tell the story or we're given the story from a black or African-American perspective. Now, let me explain something to you about Tina Turner and Buddhism. When it comes to Tina Turner, most of the stories about Tina Turner comes from a white perspective. Now, in order to really understand Tina Turner and Buddhism, we need what is called diversity. If all the stories that you get comes from white people and the stories doesn't come from a black perspective, how are you going to have a balance? How are you going to have diversity? Now, one of the things that I can say about Tina Turner and Buddhism, some of the story as it relates to Ike Turner is clearly and blatantly comes from the standpoint of a racist perspective. Now, that's saying a whole lot. But to understand Tina Turner and Buddhism, we need to have a black or African American perspective. And that's what I'm going to give you today. And that's what makes this lecture so exciting. Now, one of the things I noted, now there are three types, major types of Nichiren Buddhists. Now, Tina Turner was a Nichiren Buddhist who chanted Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. She chanted and she started with an organization called NSA or Nichiren Shoshu of America. Nichiren Shoshu of America was a Buddhist lay organization that started in America. The lay organization was a, it was a, the parent organization was an organization in Japan called the Soka Gaikai. Now, Tino Turner started chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and started to learn about Buddhism in 1972. However, in 1974, this was the time where she actually officially became a Nichiren Shoshu Buddhist or a member of Nichiren Shoshu of America. Now, what makes this interesting is that Tina officially became a Nichiren Shoshu Buddhist in 1974 and me. I also became a Nichiren Shoshu Buddhist in 1974. So, we both certainly have that in common. Now, there is a, another Buddhist organization called Nichiren Shu. And a friend of mine who used to be a Nichiren uh, Shoshu Buddhist with me, his name is Shaka. Um, say about six months ago, Shaka wrote uh, a letter uh, challenging me and criticizing me. And this is the word Shaka wrote. Shaka says, you are a bully and a terrorist, and your knowledge of Buddhism is at best shallow, 
and so are you as a person. Now, the reason that I mention that, of my being called a bully and a terrorist and my knowledge of Buddhism is shallow, I like to point out that while my knowledge of Buddhism is shallow, the one thing that we have is different is that we present a black perspective. For you to learn about Buddhism, all of the perspectives about Buddhism comes from the Japanese or it comes from Asians. But if you really want to learn Buddhism and you really want to get a black perspective, then I, Anthony Elmore, I'm the most qualified person in the world who can give a black perspective of Buddhism. Now, this lecture again is called Tino Turner and Buddhism. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to let you hear Tino Turner chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, and we're going to listen to her chant the second chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Let's listen to Tina chant and recite the Lotus Sutra for a minute. Nam myo renge kyo, 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 nam myo renge kyo. that's one of the first prayers. Okay. Now we're back. Now, what you heard Tina do, she chanted the Lotus Sutra. Now, in the Lotus Sutra, or what she chanted, the second chapter says, only Buddhas know the true entity of all phenomena. That is, appearance, nature, entity, power, influence, inherent cause, relationship, latent effect, manifest effect, and consistency from beginning to end. See, Buddhism teaches us that in life there are 3,000 worlds in a momentary state of existence. Now, when you go into the 3,000 worlds in a momentary state of existence, Buddhism teaches us that we live basically in 10 states of consciousness or 10 worlds. The lowest world is called hell. The second world is called hunger. The third world is called animality. The fourth world is called anger. The fifth world is called humanity. The sixth world is called heaven. The seventh is called learning. The eighth is called self-realization. The ninth is called bodhisattva, or being Christ-like. And the tenth world is Buddhahood. We live every day in all these states or conditions of life. Now, when we go into the Tina Turner story, we will find that Tina Turner's life was into the lower six worlds of existence. Primarily, her world was in the world of animality, where one lives on instinct and anger. And she goes from instinct, anger to hell, and most of our story is talking about the world of hell. Now also in Buddhism, there is what is called the, uh, the ten worlds, which I just said, 
And I also earlier mentioned the ten aspects. So you got ten worlds and you got ten aspects. So ten times ten is, as you know, a um, hundred. Now, so when you get 100 worlds and you take the 100 worlds to the uh, rims, each world has, each world is included in the world. So you take 10 worlds and, you, and each world is included in the world. So you got 100 worlds times 10 aspects equal 1,000 worlds times 3 rims. Now, I don't want to make this too complicated, but... When you get into the three realms, the three realms are the first one is called the realm of appearance. And then there's what is called appearance, perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. Now, when Tina Turner began to chant the words Nam Yohorin Gekyo, or some say Namu Yohorin Gekyo, she changed her state of consciousness. That is, when Tina first began to chant, that was the appearance. But what happened was her perception and conception began to change. And she got to the fourth realm, which is called her volition or her will. And she came to the fifth state, it's called consciousness. And so once you begin to chant Nam Yo Ho Ko, Tina began to realize. She says, wait a minute, I am in a state of hell. And because she realized that she was in a state of hell, and because she chanted, she was able to elevate her volition or her will. Because she elevated her state of consciousness. So when you begin to elevate your state of consciousness and your state of will, then you begin to take action. So now we come to Tina Turner in 1976. There she was, what, I think she said she had a mobile credit card and only a couple of dollars in her pocket. And she decided that. I am going to get out of this marriage. Now, what is it that spurred her? Tina chanted, Nom Yo Ho Ringe Kyo, and she did the gong yo, and she elevated her state of consciousness. And when she elevated her state of consciousness, she went from the world of hell, the world of hunger, the world of animality, the world of anger, the world of humanity, the world of heaven. And she went into the world of learning and self-realization. And she went on and she became enlightened to understand that I must walk away from this situation through practicing Buddhism. Now, let's take this thing further and try to understand Tina Turner a little bit further. Now, when you view phenomena and, and, and the happenings, you have to view phenomena from the standpoint of the past, the present, and the future. Now, let's take a look at another picture I want you to see. Like, in talking about Tina Turner, there is so much written about Tina Turner. Uh, so many people have written blogs, they've written stories, and, and people say, well, what is it that I should know about Tina Turner, or how should I understand Tina Turner and Buddhism? Uh, you take my life, and like one guy says, well, you are not qualified to really talk about Tina Turner, you are not qualified to talk about Buddhism, but let's go back into Tina Turner's past a little bit. Um, when I was uh, a young guy, you know, like a, a teenager, my first girlfriend was married, her mother was married to a man by the name of John Bullock. Now, uh, 
her name, my girlfriend's name was Cherie, and Cherie's mother was married to John Bullock. So Mr. Bullock used to fix on everything. He was a real nice guy. And, and Cherie used to tell me, she said, well, my, dad, my, dad, my stepfather is related to Tina Turner. I said, really? So I never paid any attention to it. So uh, since I was doing this lecture, I called uh, Mr. Bullock. Now is dead. He's deceased. But his son's name is John Bullock. Now, John was at my house just five days ago. Uh, he actually changed his name to, to Yoshanan. And I says, uh, um, I said, John, I know you're, you're John Bullock, and your daddy was John Bullock. How is you, you related to Tina? And John says, wait a minute, my daddy, and Tina's daddy were brothers. They were half brothers. I said, what? I said, I didn't know that. He said, you mean to tell Mr. Bullock was Tina Turner's uncle? He said, yeah. He said, Tina Turner is my first cousin. I said, really? I said, wait a minute. I said, since I'm doing this lecture, tell me the name of somebody who Tina would know that is true because uh, Tina may look on the website and see this lecture. And let's see what he says. He says now, he said, my daddy's sister's name was Mamie Lee Vincent Bullock. And she used to call him Tina's hair. I said, really? He said, yeah. Now, I want you to look at something else. Now, look at this picture here. And on November the 10th, 1984, can you imagine... 30 years ago, you see me and Tina Turner on a picture together because on November the 10th, 1984, Tina Turner was at Memphis doing a concert and I took a picture with Tina and I asked Tina to write, sign an autograph picture for us Buddhists. And I asked her to make the picture to NSA Buddhists, and Tina Turner actually signed a picture for me. Now, but my relationship to Tina goes far beyond 1984. Now, when Tina Turner first recorded her first record, um, and I think it's like about 1960, I was just a little kid in the first grade. I was in the first grade. And my sister used to imitate Tina Turner. She used to imitate Tina Turner, Turner, and all the girls in the neighborhood used to mimic Tina Turner. And so we all knew Tina Turner at her household when she was black. In fact, if Tina is listening to this, Tina would know that there was the Ike and Tina Turner Review that used to be, they used to come to a, to a club in Memphis called Club Paradise. Club Paradise was owned by Sunbeam Mitchell. And Tina and Ike used to bring the Tina Turner uh, and the Ike and Tina Turner Review to Club Paradise and they used to come to Club Paradise all the time. So I grew up understanding Tina Turner. Now, if you really want to get a fair and clear story of Tina Turner, or if you really want to get a black side of Tina Turner, I have put on this website a link to a story. Now, to understand Tina Turner, please understand the story that you read about Tina Turner in Buddhism is a slanted story. It's an unfair story. And it's a story that really borders racism. Now, if you look at the story that I posted on the website, it's in the February 15th, 1979 article. Tina Turner is on the cover of Jet Magazine. 
This story is called How Sex and Religion Keeps Turner, Turner, Tina Turner Famous and Humble. Now for decades, I mean decades, I kept this magazine on my Buddhist altar. And I kept it there because I kept Tina Turner close at heart. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to read this story, especially African Americans. Now, if you read this story about Tina Turner in Jet Magazine and how her religion kept her famous and humble, you are going to see something in the story that's very unusual. Now, in this story, and what makes this story unusual, is that you will get to see a side of Tina Turner and you get to see a side of Tina Turner that's black. Now, please understand. Please understand this. Dick Gregory once told a joke. Comedian Dick Gregory and activist Dick Gregory told a joke. Now, Dick Gregory said this joke about Michael Jackson. He says, Michael Jackson is the guy who really lives the American dream. And that he was born a poor young black man in Gary and Anna. And now he's a rich white man living in California. Now, even though Dick Gregg was making a joke, but it's the truth. Michael Jackson was born a poor black man in Carolina, and he actually died a rich white man in California. Now, whether some people may find this insulting, but Tina Turner was born a poor black woman in Nutbush, Tennessee, and she is now a rich white woman who lives in Sweden. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's the truth. Tina Turner is now a rich white woman. See, Buddhism goes a little deeper because Buddhism actually explains race. Now, I'm a Nichiren Buddhist, and we, we study a book called The Go Show. And, and in The Go Show, it talks about race. And uh, let me see what, what, what it says about race. It says, uh, let me see if I can find it, the part about race. It says this. It says, the Gosho is called a letter from Sado. It says, a sutra states that both the crow's blackness and the heron's whiteness are actually deep stains of their past karma. The non-Buddhists failed to recognize this and claim it was the work of nature. See, it is Buddhism. It's the teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha who said the crow's blackness and the hair's whiteness are deep stains of their past karma. The story of Tina Turner being born black and all of us who are born black and some are born white, this is our karma. The relationship that you're in is called karma. Karma is cause and effect or the sum total of the cause and effect life that you live. So the relationship that Tina Turner had with Ike Turner was a matter of karma. Being black and being white is a matter of karma. Now, you can be born, Q, and I'm talking to a cameraman, that you can be born black in America, and you actually can lift yourself up beyond being born black. Now, Buddhism says that is called the environment that you live in. Now, your environment is your level of consciousness. For example, you got appearance, you got perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. Now, when you begin to chant Nam Yo Ho Ko, 
you can actually lift your consciousness beyond the realm of your race. In fact, a few years ago, I was coming from Japan, and I was on the bus, you know, which, which came from the bus coming to Japan, and I'd asked a couple of sisters who were Buddhists on the bus, uh, would they like to do a story to put on the Proud Black Buddhist website? And one of the sisters told me, she says, listen, she says, I cannot do a story on your Proud Black Buddhist website because I have lifted myself or I have grown beyond the consciousness of race. So, I can understand she lifted herself beyond the consciousness of race and she really did not want to speak from the standpoint of a black person. Now, let me tell you something about Tina Turner. For example, in Tina Turner's life, Tina Turner, for example, when the movie Color Purple come out, and, and, and y'all saw the movie Color Purple, in the movie Color Purple, what's this pretty woman? Name? That was Margaret Avery that uh, played the uh, the role, I think that was her, she was Shug. She might have been Shug Avery. You know that singer of Shug? Now they offered Tina Turner that role to play Shug. And Tina Turner said, hell no, I'm not going to play no Tina, I'm not going to play no Shug Avery. I live that life for real. And I'm not about to go and live no life of being no Shug because I live that in my life. And when she walked away, she walked away from good. She decided that she was not going to live the life of a black person. Now, not only did she not live the life of a black person, she, Tina Turner, walked away. Walked all the way to Sweden to where she does not live the life of a black person. She didn't live the kind of life. Like, like, let me tell you something. Uh, let me connect some things together from the standpoint of history. And uh, Q-Dog, or Clinton, who was my cameraman back there, he knows this story so well. About two months ago, a white lady from Ripley, Tennessee, uh, looked on the Internet, and she says, Do you do business in Ripley? I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, well, come out here and I'd like you to give me an estimate in my trailer home. And I drove 70 miles all the way to Ripley. Now, when you go to Ripley, now, it's very, very strange leaving Memphis, Tennessee and going to Ripley. Now, when you go to Ripley, you will notice a sign on Highway 19. And the sign says, Tina Turner Highway, Highway 19. It's called Tina Turner. But Q and I did some work for these white people in Ripley, Tennessee. And we got to Ripley, and that morning when we got to Ripley, we stopped at McDonald's. And we saw the black people, and we saw the white people. And all the while we were in Ripley, Tennessee, it was the most uncomfortable feeling I've ever had in my life because we went back in time. Like, like, Nutbush, Tennessee does not have a post office. So if you send a letter to Nutbush, where Tina grew up at, the, the letter has to go to the post office in Ripley. So we finally, I had my navigator, and we, we went outside of Ripley, and we went so far down in Ripley that the navigator don't even work because there's no towers there. And and Q, Q said, man, we can't be down here after dark. These white people may kill us. Now, this may sound like a joke, but there we were in Ripley, Tennessee, right next to Nutbush, Tennessee, where Tina Turner come. And we got like an eerie, eerie feeling that was outright frightening. Now, I looked on the internet, I saw one brother who went to Nutbush, and he was talking about how great it was being in Nutbush. Well, Nutbush wasn't great at all to me, because when you go to Nutbush, Tennessee, 
The only thing you see in Nutbush, Tennessee is a cotton processing plant. The white lady who we did the work for in Ripley, Tennessee, she was kind enough to buy us some dinner and she went to KFC and bought some chicken. And she took the time to talk to us. And she said, sir, we sent our children to diversified schools, to integrated schools, and we try to be people who try to be fair and equitable. And what these white people did was they looked on the internet and they sought out a black business because they understood that they had to spread their money around and they understood inequality. And even though Ripley, Tennessee was 67 miles from Memphis, they wanted to give an African American an opportunity and to share business. So these were some very remarkable people who lived in Ripley and Ripley and Nutbush are adjacent to each other. Another thing about Tina Turner that you might want to understand about Nutbush, Tennessee, let me give you a little history. The first white man who came to this part of the country was the conquistador Hernando de Soto. Uh, Hernando de Soto was a conquistador conqueror. He came to conquer. Now, in about 1818, 18, I believe, uh, the man who was the seventh president of the United States actually conned the people out of land and he did a thing called a Jackson Purchase. And so Andrew Jackson in 1819 came and he named this part of the country where I live. It's called Memphis after ancient Egypt. So in 1830 he named it and Andrew Jackson was a wealthy slave owner who killed a whole lot of Indians and in this part of the country it was Chickasaw Indians. So when Andrew Jackson became the president from Tennessee in, in 1830, they, him and his Democratic buddies passed a law called the Indian Removal Act. And the Indian Removal Act was an act to remove all Native Americans. And they took all these people like animals and they spread them across the Mississippi River and took them into Arkansas. And when the Indian chief got to Little Rock, Arkansas, he started crying tears. And he says, this is a trail of tears. Now, this is in like 1830 when they read all the Native Americans away. And so after 1830, after they put all the Indians on the reservations, then all the whites start moving in from England. They came to Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina. They bought slaves. And it was coming to cash in on the white gold called cotton. So when you go to Nutbush, Tennessee, Nutbush, Tennessee is an area where whites came in and they brought slaves with them. And so from 1830, uh, when it started, when all the slaves started coming in. Now, if you go straight down the road about another 60 miles, there's a town called Clarksdale, Mississippi. Now, Clarksdale, Mississippi was started by a man by the name of John Clarksdale. Now, what makes John Clarksdale important? John Clarksdale had a brother-in-law whose name was Acorn, Alcorn, who... Um, did a favor for his brother-in-law. What he did was he put the railroad, he had the railroad instead of instead of going straight down the Mississippi River as it goes from Memphis down to New Orleans, he brought the railroad to a place called Clarksdale, Mississippi and a little town in Clarksdale, Mississippi merged. Now, let's come on up. You know, 
as you come up with it to the 1870s and the 1800s, well, around 1860 or 65 per se, Abraham, you know, the Civil War was going on, and they was fighting over slavery. Now, what happened was, there's a man, his name was Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, as you go to where Tina Turner lived in Nut Nutbush, Tennessee, in Nutbush, Tennessee, uh, there's a place called Fort Pillow, as you go coming from Memphis, going to Nutbush. Now, as I was going to Memphis and Nutbush, I thought about Fort Pillow. Because in Fort Pillow, Abraham Lincoln, in 1864, had, say, had asked the Africans, or the slaves, that if you join the Union Army, I will give your family support. So a lot of the slaves joined the Union Army. And there's this fight going on, and the Civil War was going on. And what happened during the Civil War, these blacks were at Fort Pillow. And Nathan Bedford Forrest, the man who started the Ku Klux Klan, he got so angry because he's a slave owner himself and he was a general in the Confederate Army. And he was determined to go and kill these blacks. Now he had left Memphis and went to Mississippi, but when he heard about these blacks in Fort Pillow, he took all of his regiment and they surrounded the fort and they captured the fort. And so instead of having prisoners of war, Nathan Bedford Forrest took all these black people, women and children, and he killed them all, shot them, hung them, and set these people on fire. And this thing is called the Massacre of Fort Pillow. Now, understand, when you start talking about Tina Turner, let's go into the history where Tina Turner comes from. Let's begin to tell the history. Yes, I don't know Japanese culture and history, but I know black history. Now, you didn't know that Tina Turner lived by Fort Pillow? You didn't know the culture where Tina Turner comes from? Now, how many of you out there saw the movie Roots? How did you saw Roots? Did you see Roots, uh, Q? Yeah, I think. Now, did you know that the right adjacent to Nutbush, Tennessee is hen in Tennessee. Did you know that? Now, people that's listening to this lecture, they say, wait a minute. Tina Turner from Nutbush? Well, when you saw the movie Roots, there's a man by the name of Will Palmer, right? You see Will Palmer in Roots? The Palmer House, hen in Tennessee. When you think about Alex Haley, when Alex Haley's grandmother used to talk about the slave Kunta Kente, they were right there, right next to Nutbush, Tennessee, where Alex Haley came from in Tennessee, because Hen in Tennessee and Nutbush, Tennessee is right there together. So people say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's why it's important to talk to an African American who can give you some black history. Now, let me tell you some more black history. Tina Turner's family. Tina Turner's family, after the Civil War in 1866, where Tina Turner used to sing at, where her grandmother and grandfather took her to a church. This church is called Woodland Missionary Baptist Church. Now, what's a missionary Baptist church? See, what people don't understand is that after the Civil War, or during the time of slavery, Woodland Baptist Church that Tina Turner went to, they used to have this church, and old slaves used to be at this church. Now, Woodland, after the Civil War, the slaves built a church and set up their congregation. And the church that Tina Turner went to, Woodland Baptist Church, where her grandmother and grandfather and all her relatives, that church is on the National Historic Register. Woodland Baptist Church, they had slaves who actually fought in the Civil War. Part of Tina's family, these people fought in the Civil War. Now Tina, when she was young and she spent, she's so remarkable because Tina Turner spent its life, spent it so many generations. 
Did you know Tina Turner was born in November of 1939? That means she lived during the time of World War II. She lived during the time of the Korean War. She lived during the time of the Vietnam War. She lived during the time as the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. She spanned so many generations. Also, when Tina Turner went on the Ed Sullivan Show, now when we look at the date and the date that I'm doing this lecture, this lecture is done in 2014. But now when you want to talk about Tina Turner, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, was it 50? From 2014, you know what happened, Q? We had the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, Tina Turner is married to a white by the name of Irwin Bach. But until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Tina Turner could not even vote. Tina Turner could not even have a fairness. That was a world of unfairness. So, so for us to begin to understand the life of Tina Turner, we must encompass the past, the present, and the future. Now, I'm going to bring this lecture home about Tina Turner and Buddhism. I'm going to bring it home, but I, but I want you guys to understand something. Now, even though someone says I'm not so qualified, but Tina Turner came from this area. And so did I come from this area. Q, did you want to know something, Q? In 1951, right down the street from this house, I'm talking about just, what, four or five miles from this house, it's Sun Recording Studios. And a 20-year-old man, by the name of Ike Whisper Turner went to Sun Recording Studios and him and Jackie Brimstone recorded a record. This record was called Rocket 88. Ike Turner played piano on this song. This brother hit a lick that was so bad he actually has the first recorded rock and roll record in the history of music. He is a he is an 18 year old man. Now when you look at the Jet magazine article that tells about Tina Turner and you look at that article and I want you to look at it. In this article you're going to see something that's very very rare. And that is Tina Turner is in this article with her two sons. She's with Craig, the young man that she had before she married Ike, who baby by one of the band members. And you're going to see Ronnie. Now when you see Ronnie Turner and you look at Ronnie, now you look at Ronnie today, Ronnie got those locks on his head, but you look at Ronnie Turner today, that boy looked just like his daddy, Ike Turner. Now, what happened here? What is going on with this story? When you read this Jet Magazine article, Q, you know what happens. Tina Turner did not say one bad word against Ike Turner. Not one. It was a great story, a beautiful story, but she did not say one bad word. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something about Buddhism. See, when you look at the story of Tina Turner, it is one of the most beautiful stories in the world. It is a world of someone who has achieved the greatest story in the world. And you look at it, she overcame every single hardship, and it's a story of triumph. But, and they, that is the Buddhist story that they tell. But, it takes a black man like Anthony M. Elmore to tell a real Buddhist story and let's put a good end into this story because the story that they told is not a good story, Q. Q, they told a story that is, 
immersed in racism. It is a story that is not with justice. Now, let me tell you a story about Buddhism. And tell you, let me share something with you about Buddhism. And I think you could begin to understand. Let's see, can I get to the story here? And, and, and I hope that you just bear with me until I find it here. Let's see where they got it here. Let's see. Now, uh, let's see. Let me get to it now. Now, it says here, in the 13th century, there was a a female priest. She was a, a lay nun. Her name was Moichi. Moichi is a name I like to call Tina Turner because Tina Turner is a faithful Buddhist. Now, Nitrin Shonen, who was a 13th century Buddhist, um, who actually revitalized the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha in Japan, he wrote a go show called Winter Always Turns Into Spring. This is what happened in the life of Tina Turner, Winter Turned Into Spring. That's the story in the go show that I'd like to share, and I think this story is meant for Tina Turner. Tina speaks about the power of love, and the essence of Buddhism is the power of love. Now, listen very carefully. At the time of his extinction, the world on it one of great enlightenment lamented. And this is the Buddha. The Buddha said this. He says, now I am about to enter Nirvana. The only thing that worries me is King Aja Shatru. Buddhistava Kashafa then asked him, since the Buddha's mercy is impartial, you regret dying should should stem from compassion for all living beings. Why do you sing out only King Adrashatra? The Buddha replied, So that a couple has seven children, one who falls ill, though the parents love all children equally, they worry most about the sick child. Ten times, commented on this sutra passage and its great concentration and insight and said, even if parents of seven children are never partial, they still particularly concern about the sick one. In essence, the sutra is saying that even if there are many children, the parents' heart are with the child who is ill. To the Buddha, all living beings are his children. Among them, the sinful man who slays his own parents and becomes the enemy of the Buddha, and in the sutras is like the sick child. King Ajusutra was the ruler of Magadha. That's where the Buddha came from. He murdered his father, Bim Basara, a powerful person in Sakamuni, and became an enemy of the Buddha. And now, this king, Ajusutra, killed his own father. He imprisoned his own mother. This man did the worst thing in the world to the Buddha. He became the Buddha's worst enemy. Yet when the Buddha was about to die, the Buddha said, I cannot die now because I must Look out for King Ajara Sutra. He said, almost look out for him. Because to the Buddha and to Buddhism, they worry about the sick children. Now, everyone who knows the story of Ike Turner, Ike Turner. As a young man, didn't take drugs. This man used to play the piano 
right here in Memphis, across the bridge in West Memphis on 11th Street. And he used to be playing the piano, and he was so good, this white man used to come by in a gravel truck. And, and, and he used to open the door and let this white boy come in and hear him play. And the white boy used to see how I used to jam on the piano. This white boy who used to come here, Ike, and learn for him, who used to drive that gravel truck, that white boy was Elvis Aaron Presley. Because Elvis Presley came and got his rock and roll roots from this young Ike Whisper Turner. Now, what happened to Ike Turner? It's not just Ike Turner. Everybody says, Ike Turner is the worst guy in the world. Q, that's what they say. But I challenge any African American person, look in your own family. In all of our families, we have an Ike Turner. Because in all of our families, there's one. One of us is on drugs, gambling, or women, or doing something that's bad in all of our families. But yet, we single out Ike Turner and make Ike Turner the poster child and the worst guy in the world. Now, to the Buddha. Q, are you hearing me, Q? The people are not hearing me. To the Buddha. He's a sick child. He's a sick child. You know, it says this. It says, when you read a Jet Magazine article, after I died, it says, lock up prisoner E47678 at California's Men's Colony in San Luis, Osteo, the pioneer rock and roll musician who invented the genre of music and trained several rock music legends at his knee was able to end his 15-year-old party with drugs. I turned him with a sick man. He was sick. Like so many African Americans, the man was sick. In the eyes of the Buddha, he was the Buddha's child. He should not have been judged so bad because he was sick. Now, what did they say? Even after he got out of jail, it said smoke blew up in my face. And that's all it took, the first whiff. He was a fireman who went into a burning building too many times. And he got hooked on drugs again. But it's not just like turn on so many African Americans are in jail. They do bad things because they are involved in drugs. You know, they said this man had 14 wives, and he even said himself he was harsh. But let's look at let's look at what his son said. Let's look at what Ronnie Turner said, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at what Ronnie Turner said, and let's see what Ronnie said. Ronnie said that, uh, let's see, can we get to that? Ah, let's see here. Let's see what Ronnie Turner says. In the Elvin article, it says, their son, Ronnie Turner says, I know everything that happened through his life and through my parents' divorce. He wasn't happy and still working. I could just feel it. He never acted like he got over the divorce. My father used to come to my house a lot. I never kept my phone book around. He used to rumble around trying to find, look for my, look for my mom's phone number. Before 30, he was a different kind of man. He didn't drink. He didn't use drugs. His band, the King Originals, forbidden to use drugs to drink. He was noted for firing any suspected or drinkable 
you drinking, using marijuana, cocaine, any kind of substance. When it came to business, he did not tolerate distraction. He was one of the first black musicians to keep control of his music, and he taught others, uh, others uh, about the industry. Renny says, a lot of people were trying to take my mom and do other projects with her. His possessive, it caused friction. After a while, Dad got in, introduced to drugs. To me, it's a setup. He was such a good, strong businessman that sometimes people would give you things to bring you down a little bit. And once he was brought down, he couldn't pull away. So ladies and gentlemen, we know that Ike Turner was a man out of control. Now, Ike Turner left, rather, Tina Turner left Ike Turner in 1976. Now, almost 20 years later, that movie came out. And he was trying to defend himself. He became the poster boy for treating somebody bad. And he did. But, you know, Tina Turner's sister, Ruby Aline Celico, who introduced Tina to Ike, says in the Evan article, time and age seemed to mellow her former brother-in-law. In later years, his conversation was different. He didn't seem to be aggravated all the time. He was generous and jovial. He didn't, he seemed like he was forgiven and wanted to be forgiven. They talked about bad things rather than let it pass because everybody else had Less than a year, one year before posting this video, August 27, 2013, Oprah Winfrey Network posted an interview titled, Tina Turner Recalls, the first time Ike abused her video. Tina departed Ike in 1976. For Oprah to have Tina tell about an incident that happened 53 years earlier in his life and the light of the fact that Ike Turner was deceased, moreover, Ike had paid his dues. You know, Ike Turner wrote a song where he got a Grammy Award. And he said, and the, the lyrics of a song is about Jesus. He says, I'm a bad boy, but Jesus loves me anyway. As long as Jesus loves me, I don't care what anybody say. Pointing your fingers at me, you should take a look at yourself. When you look in the mirror, you won't talk about nobody else. I did a lot of wrong things, but I did it to myself. As long as I face my wrongness, I don't care about nobody else. They did a movie about me, and all that stuff ain't true. They turned their nose up at me, what they think I'm going to do. I'm a child of God. I made a whole lot of mistakes. I can't live forever. How you think I'm going to wait? For forgiveness? Now, what I turn is saying that... He wanted to be forgiven. And yet, after he dies, that's Oprah Winfrey and talk about the bad things that he did. Those of you who are listening to this lecture, click on the link to the Evident Magazine article titled, The Last Days of Ike Turner. There are things you must understand about our culture and our culture is inherently racist. We have institutional racism. You can be a racist and not know that you're racist. For example, in Washington, D.C., there's a football team called the Washington Redskins. Many of our Native Americans find such names offensive. In the case of Ike Whistle Turner, his negative actions and a racist America presented Ike Turner with a case of nigger justice. His karma was so bad that he suffered the destiny tantamount to cancer. A cancer is something that attacks you from within. 
In the case of Ike Turner, he had the rap of the two of the most powerful black women in America. Imagine 53 years after you do something. Imagine getting on the wrong side of Oprah Winfrey and Tina Turner. In fact, as a black man, it takes a lot of guts to challenge Oprah Winfrey and Tina Turner. However, I can stand here and tell both of those black women that they are not only wrong, they are unjust and just as racist as some of our racist institutions in America. With only a mobile credit card and 36 cents of possession, the ballot singer had finally escaped her brutal 16-year marriage with Turner, and less than a month later, on July 27, 1976, she filed for divorce. Men, have you ever had a woman to leave you? I don't care who you are and how tough you may be. Brother, if a woman leave you, ain't nothing, nothing in the world worse than a woman walking out from you. When Tina Turner left Ike, that man suffered more pain and heartache than you can imagine. The magazine, the Ebony Magazine article stated that guitarist James Bino Lewis, who played with I Can Turn or Turn in the 70s, who played on the song Nut But Shitty Says, after Tina left, he just never got it again. He found women close, but they're not Tina. In the Ebony article, his caretaker, singer Felina Rasul, said, there was not a day that would go by that he would not watch the video with Tina. Can you imagine a man and a woman who walks out and not may contact you for 30 years and you die? And that woman can't even call you and say hello to you. Now, that is more pain than you can ever imagine. And after the woman leaves you, and after you suffering this kind of pain, it's not just I turn up, but Ronnie Turner, that's his daddy. And Tina Turner, and Craig, and all those children, they had to see a man get castrated and being ruled the worst guy in the world. It's horrible. But you know, and it may never come from Tina Turner, but one day I would like to get with Ronnie Turner and I'd like to get with the, the Turner family. And I would like to say a prayer for Ike Turner because in Buddhism, if the Buddha could forgive and worry about King Ajushatru, who killed his own father, and who caused the Buddha all these bad problems, and if Tina Turner could understand that the love, the love that she must have must be extended to I turn up. And she must think of those children. And she must think that she did get over the hurt. She did walk out. But we must pray and make this a real true Buddhist story by saying a prayer and offering true forgiveness I turn. That is Buddhism. Thank you very much.
Papa Gibnes. <laughs> <laughs>